Hello, and welcome to Shape the System, where we find and tell the stories that help people to rethink the way the world works. We interview people from all over the world who are helping to change our systems for the better. Shape the System is an independent podcast with support from KPMG High Growth Ventures, who help ambitious founders and their teams scale up for success. More about KPMG High Growth Ventures after the interview. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Shape the System. I'm your host, Vincent Turner. Today, we're talking to Eduardo Unwini from Piggy Vest or Piggy Bank. There's a whole different bunch of names. I'm still going to work out which of the names we're using. But we're going to be talking about savings in and the savings rate in Nigeria. And there's a whole bunch of interesting challenges here. And I, I, I don't know I don't know the smallest thing about how financial services works in Africa at all, let alone in Nigeria. So I actually want to start there if we can, and let's let's jump straight into what is the lay of the land in the retail financial services for, for, for the average Nigerian or for Nigerians generally? Right. Well, thank you for having me here. Banking in Nigeria is, like I think, a bit different than the rest of the world, especially America or Australia. Sure. So we launched Piggy Bank, as it was called, in 2016, and it's now called Piggy Vest. But one of the things that has remained is that banking is the most low reward like way to save your money in Nigeria right the retail right. structure of banking hasn't much improved i'll say to fit the habits or the growing habits that millennials and you know gen z like kind of have grown up with a lot of us spend a lot of time on our mobile phones and you know banking right. here still involves quite a bit of paperwork and makes it not as attractive as state in tech. Just day-to-day banking. Just day-to-day banking, right? Yeah. You could go to an ATM, try to <laughs> withdraw, uh, the funds are not dispersed, and this will mean a visit into the bank, right? Only very few right. banks have a way for you to actually report a non-dispense from your phone. Same as all Got the it. other challenges around, like, uh, around your day-to-day like financial operations. So still largely paper-driven, and that represents a problem. Great. Okay, I've got a I've got a bunch of follow up questions here, but I'm going to start firstly with the I guess the behaviour of of people, and I don't I'm, demographic wise, let's call it under 35. I'm, I'm guessing something around that demographic. You know, the in Nigeria at the moment, they in terms of their ability to save and invest as a as a behaviour set. If you say pre 2016, what, what's typically someone doing, or can they do anything? Like, how what is what does the savings rate in, in the country look like? How are people actually growing wealth, or even just doing day to day savings if it's not even investing? Well, I mean, I, I'll say that uh, savings wasn't like a big part, especially for young people. Sure. Very low savings rates and very difficult as well when you consider the system that we're like operating with. When you open right. a bank account in Nigeria, uh, you get a an ATM card, withdrawal slips, and all of these like very intricate ways to spend your money. <laughs> but then when you try to consider saving in a Nigerian bank account, when you like look at all of the charges surrounding it, right? You know, account maintenance charges, SMS charges, ATM maintenance charges, you kind of end up with less than you started out with. So it made savings <laughs> very difficult. Right. And then if you think about investment, investment was like uh, there's treasury bills and bonds, which gave like very interesting returns at the time, but right. very exclusive, right? A, the minimal like buy-in amount pre-2016 was about, I think, 200,000 naira. 200,000 naira translates to about $500 or something, but right. the average um, income here is about $200. So that's telling some people, yeah, you know, you're not going to be able to invest unless you're putting together two, three months of your money so you can take advantage of it. So it was a really broken system. And right. the, the the event that actually um, inspired Piggy Bank was a woman who had saved in an actual wooden box. So people, right. just by having uh, two, three traditional bank accounts, were saving in actual wooden boxes. That's why <laughs> we decided to build Piggy Bank. <laughs> Right, you, you, at this point, you're thinking there's got to be a, a better way. And I, I do want to get onto the solution because I think there's some really interesting parts to the solution. In fact, there's parts of what you're doing with Piggy Vest and Piggy Bank 
that I'm trying to work out why they don't exist in outside of Nigeria and outside of Africa. So there's some stuff there which I definitely want to get to. But I think the thing that's interesting for me in the first instance is that, that we often talk about this idea that there's kind of a, a sort of a core set of infrastructure that has to exist in banking and then you build retail banking on top of that, right? So you need kind of trusted institutions, you need some of the infrastructure to enable payments to float. And, you know, in, in a lot of, you know, thought process of, of what's happening in Africa, there's a lot of that infrastructure potentially isn't there. But the counterpoint to that, and you, we often hear the sort of the M-Pacer example, is that there's this infrastructure that's kind of leapfrogging that, it's enabling it all to be mobile first, and it kind they don't kind of need the core infrastructure that you would have thought about. But it sounds to me that up until the last few years, potentially with yourselves and maybe some others in, in the space generally, not just in Nigeria, but that's that's actually not the case. There's still uh, most people don't have access to the kind of banking that you would expect in any you know if you if you grew up in Switzerland or in Sweden or in, in the US or Canada or Australia, you sort of almost take for granted that you can have an account, you can have an ATM card. You're not still filling out bits of paper to your point before, and this this isn't the case with the with the infrastructure at the moment day to day. Is that right? Uh, so no, I, I think that like now it's improved vastly. Right. When we started to build Piggyvest, Piggyvest is not built on any banking infrastructure. We built the entire thing from scratch and then right. partnered with payment infrastructure to kind of make the payments work. Uh, incidentally, right. the payment partners that we use also launched in 2016 and have gone on to Just power convenient. like almost all of the like merchants ac- across the country and across Africa. So they are called Flutterwave and Paystack. Sure. And so there is a lot of improvements now going on. First of all, a lot of fintech companies have launched. That means that you can now open like mm-hmm. accounts from your phone. And a lot of banks are now catching up to that right. as well. There's instant accounts. There's still elements of paperwork there. Uh, and, you know, there's still quite a bit of friction with the getting of the cards and the getting of like related documents to the accounts. But it's getting better and infrastructure is getting better. Right. As far as like innovation and tech right. goes, finance may actually be the most affected sector in Nigeria. Right. Interesting. So even in the last, I mean, we're 2021 now. So in the last five years, there's been a quite an ascension of retail financial services at the yeah. kind of baseline level. I yeah. guess what are the thing that I'm trying to understand with that, though, is if everyone has access to an account, but the banks are still focused on helping you with ways to spend your money as opposed to save your money, then you're creating a class of people who could develop good savings behaviors and could have access to investments and aren't doing that. I'm trying to understand what the impact of that is. Like if you've got, you know, how many, there's 206 million people, I think, in Nigeria or something that I checked yeah. before jumping on. Hopefully I've got that number right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, if you've got a, you know, my guess is you've got probably got 40% of the people who are under the age of 35 or 40, like that's kind of the general yeah. kind of demographic. If you have an entire generation of people who aren't developing any kind of savings behavior, what's the net outcome of that, I guess, would be my first question. Well, I mean, the first thing to like recognize from the 206 million number is that about 60% of them are like off. 50 are unbanked and they don't participate in the formal banking right. unbanked at all yeah unbanked yeah so they don't wow. participate in the formal banking sector so the number that you're talking about is actually like maybe half right okay. and then when you look <laughs> at people who are like you know underbanked is another like sector that we like to like to categorize and so there's mm-hmm. about 40 45 million bank accounts that are actively used in nigeria and so Right. Developing like savings behavior for young people is actually the best way to go because they are the ones most likely to interact with financial apps on their phone, most likely to interact with financial and investment mm-hmm. apps on their phone. I can I was mentioning that like retail like services have improved and all those investment opportunities that used to be at two hundred thousand naira are now at ten thousand naira, twenty thousand naira. So the entry like ticket size since the advent of fintech has actually been brought down and made affordable. Well, for the most part. Right. Got it. I say <laughs> that, you know, the, the target market for financial services and fintech and all of those things is not the uh, massive 200 million, 200 million people. If you're using tech and you're trying to approach it from, or you can access my services via an app, you're only targeting maybe half of the population at best. And then we have the people who are focused on financial right. inclusion targeting the other half. Got it. Got it. And would you say you're, with what you're doing with PiggyVest, it's, it's largely focusing on people who are already in the financial services system, but yeah, giving them correct. access to better financial yeah. services? Yeah. Do you feel like are you, I and mean, this is kind of a tangent, tangential question, but 
are you starting to even find people who aren't in the system who are like, well, that's the version of banking and financial services that I want and I wasn't previously in the system or it's a bridge too far? No. Uh, So, yeah, I think that might be taking it a little too far because there is several reasons why they're not in the system. The most important would be that they're living very likely below the poverty line. And that means that the immediate need that they'll have is not savings probably be access to credit or some other financial service, but they do not get to start from savings. That's one. The second thing would be that there's a potential barrier to entry there, given that PiggyVest is an app and our services are only accessible via the web or a smartphone, right? Which right. also excludes like them. So uh, the, this version of PiggyVest as it currently exists is focused on people who are just at the baseline technologically savvy, can approach a feature phone, can download apps, can yep. sign in and, you know, can enter their bank accounts and stuff like that. There is something to be said for financial inclusion, but we haven't started on that path yet. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> Can't, can't solve all the problems at once. Um, yeah. Absolutely. So if, if we're just, just getting back then to the people who are in your specific target market, and you said, look, there's probably around half of those people, and let's call it 45 million, I think, was the number you just yeah. just mentioned. And you're, in, in fact, today, PUS is reaching about 2 million of that 45 million. That's a, an outstanding number, by the way. That, that seems... That's we, <laughs> we hope to get more. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, but I'm, I'm just impressed. I just, I mean, that number is ten percent of the population of Australia. So I guess I'm, I'm putting it into, that, into those, <laughs> into those terms. But just, just getting back to the behaviour, let's call it the forty-five million, and, and I want to contrast it with what Piggy Vest customers are doing and saying. But in the world where you are part of the financial system in Nigeria but you're not starting to leverage this kind of technology, the behavior is I have an account, I'm able to go and use it, I can spend money pretty easily, I've probably got a card, Um, there may be some mobile banking services potentially, but it's still quite a manual process to get an account or to do anything if the thing doesn't work kind of thing. But with regards to savings and investments, is that just basically an overlooked part of how the retail banking system works, even for those people who have an account? Well, I mean, it was overlooked. It was overlooked. Sure. Uh, Pre-2016, there wasn't a lot of emphasis placed on saving for the future. Right. Right. Not like now. Now Nigerians are like more exposed. They're looking at very interesting like products like cryptocurrency, you know, dollar investments. People are kind of, you know, stepping into their own as far as uh, investments and savings is concerned. And so that's a very interesting, right. like, uh, side effect, I guess, of fin- the advent of fintech, specifically from 2016. So now people are refusing right. for the emphasis not to be on savings and investment. So that's, that's like, very cool. Interesting. Okay. So I guess that was the thing I was trying to get to, is it sounds like there's been a change in behavior, largely driven by an awareness of it within a population, it sounds like a banked but millennial population, of you should be doing better with this stuff. It's not enough yeah. to just say, oh, I, I can't do it. Well, you don't have an excuse. These these capabilities and these technologies exist. And there's a there's a shift to kind of an, a, a self-empowerment. Is that part of what's, what's going on there? Yeah. You could actually say that. And it's just like, you know, it, it's a case of, you know, like teaching a man to fish or something like that instead of just handing them the fish. So <laughs> yeah. here, like apps are, apps are like launching daily and encouraging you to, take full control of your financial life and that leads to like a bit more curiosity I suppose than we used to have when Mm -hmm. it came to financial services and so that's kind of where like we all are right now right everyone is like oh yeah you know I've started saving and investing and someone is saying oh look something called bitcoin something called litecoin something called this coin and all of that (laughs) and so people are going crazy for personal finance now right and then, like, if you had to put your finger on the cause, the root causes of why that started happening in the last five years, it sounds like you, Piggy Vest, are, are filling a need, but you're you're not necessarily driving the demand. What do you think has created that? Is it people being more connected on devices and seeing what's happening elsewhere? What's what's actually driving the demand in the first place? Well, I I, I think that it, it was actually again it was the launch of fintech companies like ours in 2016. We right. had the launch of Paystack, Flutterwave, and PiggyVest, and right. like uh, and, and then it became clear that to people that savings could be easier, 
savings could be interesting. Investment could be easy. Investment could be interesting. And, you know, we brought down all the entry like ticket sizes. The minimum you can save on piggy right. is about 100 naira, which is about 30 cents. There is not a bank that allow right. you to do that. And, you know, the minimum you can invest on piggy right. is about $10. Investment houses just don't care enough about you to allow you to do that. So we decided that like it's time yeah, to democratize this. Yeah. <laughs> and so right. we decided that like democratizing access to all of these services is very important. And then on the back of that, several companies started to launch as well as they should. And so there's been this outpouring of ways, different ways to take control of like take back control of your finances. And so, you know, something jump started it and now it's continued. And we like to think that we were a part of that. Yeah. I I think that's fascinating because so often what you sort of look for is an unmet need, right? When when you go into launch a product in any context, right? It doesn't need to be in financial services. But you you're often that there's a pent pent up or a latent demand sitting here. And I guess in a way there was, but it seems amazing that the the kind of incumbent financial services systems in Nigeria didn't say there's a whole, you know, stack of people here, call it 45 million people who have money and do Mm -hmm. want to invest and save. And you will make, there is a financial opportunity for you to work with them. You just need to meet them where they are. And um, that, that that really took for yourselves and sounds like some other companies as well to, to launch those products for that, you know, for that market opportunity to be created. That, that just seems fascinating to me that mm-hmm. it had sort of been sitting there for that long. I guess there's a confluence of a few things happening, right? Because you have had some alternative investment classes and you've made mention to some cryptos, obviously, and that they're examples, but I think there's others and we're going to talk about some of the piggy vest ones in a minute. Obviously, there's a proliferation of smart devices and the fact that, you know, you don't just have to own an iPhone anymore. You can get a $20 Android device and have a smartphone. Yeah. Um, you know, which just wasn't the case five or six years ago. They're just, they're, I mean, or maybe five or six years ago, but certainly not 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. I guess to, do, to a degree, that phone comes with a set of data enabled. So it means that you're aware mm-hmm. of what's happening more broadly, not just, okay, well, this is what the bank told me and that's all I know. That's my my universe of opportunity. It sounds like I'm just trying to understand a little bit more about some of those macros, but am I, am I missing anything there in terms of some of the things that led up to creating these conditions where it's like everyone's primed for, a piggy vest to come into market? Well, I, I don't think that there was, I mean, I'll say that it was like people using technology, mm. starting to get comfortable with technology was probably a very huge part of why it was the right time for piggy vest to launch. Right. right. We could, we couldn't have like gotten the success that we got in 2016 and 2013. People just weren't as comfortable with tech <laughs> products as they are as they were in 2016. Right. So it's kind of like, and the products that right. are launching now in 2021 could never have made a go of it in 2016. So there is a kind of market readiness, right. co- collective market readiness, sure. collective comfort yeah. with digital services. Right. I, I, I'm telling you that like uh, it would mm-hmm. have been hard to convince people to access financial services solely via their phones in 2013 or before. Right. And because we have older people joining right. our platform and understanding that they cannot, that, that there's no branches and we have no ATMs and things like that. Right. But to convince them would have ha- been to do the job of technology adoption, which we didn't do. People just started to adopt technology more, right. Right. use more things on the internet. And then it became natural that they would also access financial services via the internet. Interesting. And the re- I guess, the, and I've, I know I've harped on about this for a little bit, but so often when we talk to people on this show, they're having to create behavior change. And it sounds to me like what has actually happened here is a set of conditions have created a set of behaviors. And you've said, yeah. what else can we throw into that behavior change? I just yeah. find that's a really fascinating narrative. A lot of the, you know, in Australia as an example, but this is happening in Europe and the US as well, there's a shift to these kind of neo banks. But what they're doing is they're coming to market with things that are actually quite similar in a lot of respects, yeah. other than the branding and the messaging, to what already exists in the marketplace. And so they're having mixed success because people are like, well, I already sort of have mobile banking and the ability to use my card and the user interface is pretty nice. And you've had a sort of a, sim- a different situation here, which is people have said, I'm doing all this stuff on my device. Why isn't my banking working this way? I'd prefer it work this way. And the incumbents, for whatever reason, have no reason to operate that. I want to come back to one thing that you sort of hinted on a little bit earlier, which I I just want to try and understand the mechanic of it. It sounded like to operate the service that you're operating in Nigeria, you didn't need to 
actually go and get a banking license and operate as a bank. Have I understood that correctly? Oh, no, no, no. That's not correct at all. We had to. Okay. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, I'm glad I clarified that point. <laughs> when we started, like we ourselves had to do a lot of research around this. And we obviously right. couldn't afford to get a banking license. So we launched in partnership with the microfinance bank. Right. So we definitely had to get the regulatory part like on lock before like moving forward with it. You do have to be regulated. Like Nigeria is actually very heavily, our financial sector is heavily regulated. Right. Good. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But (laughs) so, okay. So, so you, you went to market with a, a banking partner who would then provide not only the kind of ability to operate in the way that you do, but also some of the underlying rails and, no, not, not, the not, not the tech. Not the tech. Not the tech. Okay. So like I mentioned, we built the tech from scratch by ourselves because, right. again, it was right. unique. But the uh, what we needed was the financial aspect, the warehousing, the investment. And so right. that's definitely what we like needed the banking partner for. Got it. Got it. And is in, in, in that respect, is you know, it, again, I'm thinking about the kind of the the US experience. I was there for five years and, and observed it happening there. You, you saw initially banks who had the banking capability, let's call it that, let's not ignoring the tech for the minute, uh, had the ability to operate, you know, in a white label sense for other people who wanted to bring banking services to market, but were quite hesitant mm-hmm. to do so because they're like, oh, we don't want to cannibalize our own thing. It sounded like you were able to identify a banking partner who said, no, we, we want other things to exist, but we're not the one to build a direct-to-consumer mobile-only bank, so yeah. why don't you partner with us to do that? Is that how that sort of played out? No, well, not really. The the banking partner we had was direct to consumer, right? Okay. So, uh, but for the most part, the banking sector is a game of numbers here. So, right. the higher the volume, the better for them. And I know I think that the analysis here would be they didn't like if this if 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 this works out, they don't lose anything. You know, they gain. Right. If it doesn't work out, they also don't lose anything. Right. It's just right. like money doesn't work. So they partnered with us, even though they're direct to consumer and we're trying to do something new that was also direct to consumer. Interesting. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely thinking there may be some cultural differences there because in Australia, most banks would be like, we don't want to build a competitor to ourselves <laughs> or a supporter well, I mean, to ourselves. So. They probably didn't see it as a competitor to, ourselves, to themselves in that it, um, in 2016, younger people, we did not have a lot of financial capital. Let's start there. Right. And so right. it was probably like, uh, well, if they capture the young people, like we've been trying to do, it's a positive for us. Right. So that's right. probably part of the thinking there. So it wasn't as much a competitor in that way because all banks were str- like, I think very intent on trying to get the younger population part- to participate more in the services that they offered. Got it. Got it. Understood. Okay, and probably in some respects needed an alternative brand for that to all operate under because it's hard to bring that yeah. all under one brand house, I would imagine. So let's let's mm-hmm. let's switch gears a bit. I, I want to understand a little bit more about the kind of the products within the piggy vest kind of suite, and then the jobs that each of those are doing. Can, it, there's about four or five of them on the site, but I'm just wondering if you can sort of step me through a few of those and how they operate and how people like what they get out of them. Well, um, there is about five savings wallets and then there's the investment marketplace. So there's six features. Mm-hmm. We have the piggy bank, which is the strictest wallet that exists on the platform, allows people to save daily, weekly or monthly, gives them an interest. But you cannot withdraw from that wallet more than once every quarter, else you will be charged a 5% okay. penalty fee. And that's mostly, that's what we actually, right. that was the original idea. And that's why it's still called piggy bank to kind of give right. you a 90-day savings period so that you can meet up with the responsibilities that drove you to the platform in the first place. And then we have the safe lock feature, right. with, which operates like a tre- the average treasury bill. You put money in okay. it, you get your interest up front, you get the capital at maturity. Then we have right. the flex dollar, which is basically saving in US dollars and earning interest in US dollars and just kind of trying to hedge against like the the Mm. Naira devaluation. We have target savings, which is a very flexible piggy bank, so to speak. Uh, You can save towards specific targets, like say, I want to get a MacBook in 21 days. The feature will help you break it down into, or this is how much you need to save to get to that amount in 21 days and then begins to debit you. At the end of 21 days, you get your funds and then you get interest accrued as well. 
And lastly, we have the flexible Naira wallet, mm -hmm. which functions like an average bank account. It's warehouse money there, and you can withdraw at any time. Right. But it also earns interest and far better okay. interest and than the bank account will offer. Got it. And we'll, we'll come to the investments in a little bit because I think there's some some interesting stuff that's happening there. You just just in the middle, like there's five different options there. It's a fully mobile experience, so people aren't walking into a branch. How how are you bridging the gap from I've got a banking account, but I have never done savings or investments, to I've got five options, which one do I choose? Like, how was that journey? I'm just curious about how you take the customer on that journey for a start. So th that's a very cool question because that's one of the reasons why our biggest marketing strategy is referrals, right? right? What we do. So referrals mean that when you come onto the platform as a person who's referred, the person who's doing the referring has to take you through the platform. And teach you really? about it before they before they can get their referral bonus. So they have to teach you about really? each feature. Yeah. <laughs> so That's you have to you cool. have to successfully <laughs> execute five steps, which will teach you about each of the features before before they get their reward and then you continue saving. That's a fascinating idea. Like no like there's absolutely no knowledge of that in like a Hey, I've got a, a referral link and if you sign up and put fifty bucks in, then I get twenty bucks and that's the end of it. Um, yeah, I no, love that. We, we don't we don't <laughs> want you to put just fifty bucks. So you try something in each of these wallets I've just explained, right? Mm. And then the person is then able to get their reward, and then you just move on. Yeah, yeah, and and I mean, because I, I was going to say part of this is this is why I was getting to the behavior change stuff before. If people are already primed to, to to try the thing, awesome, but still managing to get them to change the behavior. A lot of what I've observed in financial services and, and PFMs especially, and I spent five years trying to build one in the US, so I sort of got pretty close to it, is that there's a segment of people for whom the behavior change is a reflection of what they already want, and they're pretty self-directed and self-motivated, and that's about one in 10 people, give or take. Yeah. For everyone else, mm -hmm. it's like, I want this thing, and I want the outcome of this thing, but I don't want to do this thing, <laughs> <laughs> for which automation is the kind of the only way to to land that. And it sounds like that first option that you, that was the original kind of core proposition was we will automate this thing for you and stop you doing the thing that you would otherwise do, which is to just draw it out when the number looks healthy, like 10 days from now. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's still a big part of it, right? So, which is actually automating the behavior to give, to give you the outcome you're after. Is that right? Yeah. Essentially, that was how exactly how we started. So we will take the responsibility of deciding to put the money aside off of you and right. that way, it's, so you're not having to decide to do it, which is where like the problem typically is save to save or not to save now. Like once you set the instruction, it just happens. And then right. you can access the funds for 90 days. If not, you have to pay uh, us out of your hard earned money. And then after 90 yeah. days, you have the money. And so people are happier. Yeah. <laughs> There's a, there's a wonderful thing in behavioral economics they talk about, which you're probably aware of, but maybe for everyone else who's listening, this idea of loss aversion being a far greater motivation than, you know, than gain, you know, if you say to someone, you're going to lose 5% of your savings, <laughs> you're like, well, bugger that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, that's super fun. Okay, cool. So, so we start with the, um, you know, with the, with the kind of the, it's kind of a sweep product, I guess, and it's, a, it's either roundups or sweeps. Is that how the mechanism's working? It just says every day I'm just going to take a dollar out of your account. What's it? No, no, no. So it's, it's, it's a bit different than how it's a work everywhere else because we, we don't, right now we don't get to crawl your account to know like what is free and what isn't. Right. So you come into the platform and then you decide I want to save a hundred naira every day or a thousand naira right. a week or five thousand naira a month. And then we just follow your instructions. Got it. Got it. Okay. So it'll just, it'll say, it'll just move money from wherever you have money to this savings account and say, you don't look at that, don't touch it. You're not allowed to 5% penalty otherwise. Yeah. Just getting to the third option you talked about, which was the, I guess it's effectively a stable coin in some respects, a US peg. What, what's, you, you used the word, the devaluing of the current, the nearer coin, is that, or nearer currency, is that a, a kind of concern within the population or your target market? Well, I mean, it's a concern for richer people, I'll say. Right. Well, I mean, okay, so to phrase it right, it will be, it's an immediate concern for richer people, like everyone watching, but like, it's a con just like a generic concern for the average person. And the reason for that is for most Nigerians, we are concerned that like the Naira is getting devalued against the dollar. That's very, because it means that like effectively right. the value of your funds is reducing. But on the, the flip side of that sure. is that all almost all of our expenses are also in Naira. 
So while we're concerned, right. we're also concerned right now about improving our status even in the Naira. So that's why I said like immediate concern for some, right. Right. general concern for others. Got it. Understood. Yeah, it was it was kind of an in, like the, the, often you hear these arguments for you know cryptocurrencies is that they enable someone who has a who is in a country where the currency has the potential to be devalued to actually offset that in some way, and whether that's against U.S. dollars or some other you know crypto that you know that that argument is often heard. I just you know I think usually that goes hand in hand with I would say not strongly regulated financial services markets and not strongly regulated countries generally which I don't believe Nigeria is the case. Yeah. So I was just curious if that was part of the kind of the, the lexicon <laughs> in, in that respect. <laughs> just getting onto the onto the actual rates of savings, this is the thing I couldn't reconcile. So I was looking at Piggy Vest and I was looking at the five possible savings options that you just outlined. But the rates of returns in those accounts from an interest perspective seemed quite high given that global banks are kind of a sub 1%. Can you just explain that and reconcile that for me a little bit? I'm just, I just want to make sure I've understood that correctly. Well, I mean, uh, Nigeria is slightly different again. So it's the rest okay, cool. of Africa, I think. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so your interest rates are actually like very, interest rates are comparative with the level of inflation in the country, right? right. You know, yep. US inflation, I think is about 2%. That could be wrong. I'm not sure. So interest rates yep. will hover around that just enough for your funds to like, you know, catch up to them year on year. Uh, in Nigeria, interest rates stand at about, uh, inflation rates start at about, I think, 10.75% or 11. I'm not, I'm not, I can't remember the exact right. number. So that means that we actively right. have to strive to give our customers comparative interest rates to make sure that they can at least retain the value of their money. That's why the interest rates seem high to you, but here right. they're actually just very normal. Okay. <laughs> I was wondering if there was an arbitrage opportunity, to be perfectly honest, but I guess what you're <laughs> playing with on the other side is that there's an exchange risk if you do that. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's actually kind of an interesting kind of segue from there because I think if you if what you're saying to people is you, you're you're working hard for this money, you, we're creating a way for you to to retain the money. And what you're trying trying to do here is not so much say, "Hey, put the money here, and we're going to give you a huge interest rate." What we're going to do is preserve yeah. wealth, and so the savings part of this is a wealth preservation. And so, just on the, the flip side of that, then is that you have this whole and you know you actually t- used the term marketplace before, investment marketplace. So let me, let me understand a little bit more about how that functions and how that contrasts to the savings element of this. Well, I mean, the investment, so the savings element, people save and we decide how and what to invest in and what the portfolio makeup is. On the investment marketplace, we are vetting third party investment opportunities, bringing them into the app, and then people are making the decision to invest in those things. Right. So that's kind of the difference. And then, and then typically, you know, what, what are the... In- like, what are the investments that people might have the ability to make a decision on? Like, what are they investing in? Uh, very, varying types of investment uh, opportunities in agriculture, transport, real estate, fixed income, loan portfolios, really anything that has the potential to bring a return and has solid financials behind it. All right. So you, you're almost going and getting pre-vetted deals like, okay, this person needs to build a factory and they're going to need you know, 10 million US dollars or equivalent in Nigerian currency. And no, about 50 well, million naira maximum. <laughs> uh, we, yeah. don't, we don't go above around, uh, what, it'd be like maybe a million dollars. Not, not, we've not done above okay. that, like per time. But it's uh, something that we'll the person individually it, yeah. would never be able to do. Yeah, so the yeah, individual exactly. would never be able to invest in that thing. So you're almost saying we've got a deal that needs financing. We've, we understand this is a 18 month, you know, um, investment that has a coupon rate of 32% or whatever it is. Yes. And we're going to bring that investment into our network and let people invest directly in that and choose to invest in that as opposed to exactly making that investment and just rolling it into the, to the overall savings rate. Is that right? Yes, exactly. Fascinating. That's super interesting. And then how, like, how, like the, the always, I mean, it's essentially operating a peer-to-peer marketplace for these investments. Exactly, something like yeah. that. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Mechanically, how how on earth do you manage to manage that? That's like that sounds like a nightmare to manage. How, I mean, how do you bridge that? No, not really. So once we no. make sure that uh, the financials are solid, like for instance, we will not like uh, we will not list anybody that doesn't have like uh, at least 
two years, three years of operational historicals that That's doesn't right. have insurance or some kind of guarantee that makes sure that the money will come back, right. you know, and you, you will check into your company, the people behind the company. We have like insights into what you're spending the money on. I mean, I, was th- I, 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 I don't think that like it's as, it, it sounds like as if it's like a drag, but it's really not because all of these things are done way before we even list it on the platform. So at the point of listing, the entire end to end due diligence is already done and people are just investing and then sure. in like nine months get their return. We also try to not do, um, to list and- investments longer than a year so that the turnaround time is pretty quick. Right, right, right. I mean, it, in, in essence, it's a for, it's a part of the business le- lending stack. And you said this is the area where we can understand the risk well and yes. there's reasonable margins in there. And we will invest in it anyway. We will go and fund this thing, but we will make it possible so our customers, in terms of the $2 million on the other side, can choose to specifically be involved in funding that thing as opposed to just taking their rate of investment. Yeah. And, have ex- and effectively have risk ex- exposure to the upside or otherwise in that investment as opposed to just give me my 7% or whatever that number is. Yeah. That's still a fascinating model. Sorry, there's a, I've got a whole bunch more questions on that, but <laughs> I'm going to hold up to it. I want to understand how you ended up creating this and you and your, your, you're one of the co-founders, but how did, did you guys arrive at this in the first place? What were you doing before you started to, to do Piggy Best and Piggy Bank? We, we were running a bunch of other startups, uh, myself and my co A bunch of so other startups. We, yeah. <laughs> So we ran a company called Push CV and several other ones. And then we got the idea for Piggy Vest in 2016. So we've known each other since university. So we've been working together on like okay. several projects. Yeah. Okay. And, and sorry, you, um, who, who's we? Is this three of you? How many, how many of you? Yeah, three of us. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. And, and but that's still, a, that's still quite a leap. That's kind of a, and one thing led to another and suddenly we had Piggy Vest. Like what led to, you know, I mean, you had a vision of what problem this would be solving for the customer, but there's also a really interesting, nuanced way that you're actually solving this both for the customer and creating, you know, the ability to lend money to businesses in Nigeria as well. Like, th- there's a lot of in- a lot that you would have to have known about how that market operates or is dysfunctional. Where did all that intel and knowledge come from? Like, what were your backgrounds in that respect? We learned on the job, I'll say, because I'm a computer really? engineer by training. Yeah. Um, yeah. My co-founders are a com- a mechanical engineer and computer science. So it's not okay. like we worked in finance or anything. We did have experience right. building B2C startups. So we have like an understanding right. of the market. But we've essentially evolved the products as we've gone along watching customer behavior, watching how the fintech ecosystem has evolved and watching how the needs of SMEs have evolved as well, right? So all of these things from our perspective Mm. seem like natural, like follow-ups to what we've been building. (laughs) You make it sound so easy. I'm sorry, that's why I'm laughing because I'm like, all right, okay, sure. (laughs) And the time that you went from, hey, an idea to 2 million users, you know, I I, I sort of was started my journey with, you know, which I'm, you know, five years into at the moment as well. And um, I, like, I'm, I'm just so impressed with the amount of progress you made. I'm, I'm just personally stoked. Thank you. It's super awesome to see. And, Thank I, and you. I guess to that point, you know, you're, you're at two million now. You, you, I think you said earlier that we could have a lot more users. How are you thinking about the rest of the market in Nigeria and potentially even more broadly than that now? Like, where, <laughs> where to from here with you guys? Well, uh, more people in Nigeria for one. Sure. <laughs> we, like we definitely need to capture a bit more people in Nigeria, but we're also starting to think uh, very seriously about other emerging markets. And there is obviously like uh, some research and some decisions to be made. Should we expand across Africa or should we look at emerging markets as a whole and look at Latin America right. when we're thinking about expansion as well? So that's what kind of at that point where we're starting to like, where, where next? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, you've obviously, you know, if you've got 2 million out of 45, you've got a lot of upside potential where you are. Yeah. One of the things I wanted to understand, and, I, and I, I might be going down a, you know, pathway here that's not correct, but there's a there's a kind of a, a savings mechanism that is evident in, I think in Nigeria, but in, in a lot of African and also in a lot of Latin American company, uh, countries uh, that relates to it's kind of like a savings pool. I think the the word for it is isusu. Is that right in in Nigeria? And that's that's the word for cooperative. Okay, a cooperative where people yeah. there's kind of a yeah. hey, there's a group of people who come together and they contribute collectively to be able to help someone who needs to buy a thing that they need to buy, and yeah. they do it as a social contract that then says when you need that, then the group will do that for you, kind of thing. Is that yeah. kind of roughly how yeah. they work? Okay, cool. That's kind of how uh, it works. Yeah. 
Yeah, and and, then, and they're everywhere. They're, these are, I mean, I remember I was in the Village Capital Accelerator, which is actually how I got introduced to you through through Victoria Fram, yeah. who was also on the show, actually. First episode, actually. She was super cool to, to do our first episode, which was super nice of her. And there was even a company in that, in our cohort in 2014, who was, who was exploring that behavior in Central America. I guess the, the thing I was interested in is it is the, those collectives, whether they're used as savings pools or financing pools, the way a community gets together to solve a problem when there isn't a kind of regular banking solution they've in place, it, it, is a lot of what you're doing saying there's already the behaviours here, people want to do this stuff, but the infrastructure and the solutions just aren't there and, and that's the natural place for us to be going? Is that part of the thinking here? Well, I mean, we we didn't like uh, consider like uh, all of those things when we started, honestly. We started based on... <laughs> We just we spotted a need and we decided right. why not experiment around this and then we started to grow along that. So the evolution of the product is usually informed by what are the users saying they want at this point and that's informed by data that we're seeing. So that's kind of how we've like right. improved the product. So the investment marketplace right. and everything else has followed is based on what are the behaviors of the customers at this point and where do we think it's headed. Right. That's a, that's a that's a wonderfully rational engineer's response. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Well, I I um I guess I I always like to understand like when when people you know come on the show and and uh, are, are up to where they are up to, like what what would be useful in in taking forward what, where you're up to at the moment, or how you know how how what's the big thing that you need to get through in the next you know three to six or twelve months, and like. You know, what, what's that hill to be overcome? Like from, from your perspective, like what is the, the next major thing that you're trying to achieve and like what would be the thing that would unlock that for you and, and maybe if it's something that people who are listening might be able to help with? Well, we, we will hopefully kickstart our Series A fundraise by the middle of like the year. So that's one. We are targeting ending this year with about 5.5 million users. So that's the next big thing. Uh, getting there would involve like, you know, re-engineering business strategy, fundraising, hiring. So that's kind of, it's, it's not one thing. It's a combination of really tiny, really annoying things that we have to do. <laughs> just and annoying then, things. You know, yeah. <laughs> so just like um, <laughs> we'll do all those things and then right. hopefully we can get to the target and start to seriously think about like the expansion strategy that I mentioned. So those things are like, uh, like I mean, if it was one big thing, then I'd be able to say, oh, you know, X, but just like that. it's all those op- <laughs> just operational things that we have to get through right. and get done. Yeah. And just just on that, like when I did some research, you know, on PiggyVest, the, there was one of the articles that came up when you did, we don't typically talk about funding rounds, but but it came up in TechCrunch for, um, and I was curious about that because I'm, I'm assuming that the investors who invested early on probably came out of Village Capital and that broader network or was a lot of that money that came out of the US? Like how did it end up in TechCrunch? which you kind of think of as a kind of, a, I don't know, is it an American kind of centric publication? Not sure. <laughs> no, we just, we just, we just granted an interview. We, we had only Village Capital as the American like investor. We got the 50K right. from the sign up FinTech Acceleration. And then right. we went on to raise the rest from local investors here in Nigeria and then granted an interview to TechCrunch. Yeah. And I guess if my thought was going to be, are you expecting to raise your Series A from again from within Nigeria or are you looking more broadly in terms of the type of investor pools that you're interested in? Well, I mean broadly, uh, but definitely with significant Nigerian participation as well. Right. I think that there is a lot of resources that can be tapped here, uh, same as in the UK or in the US. So we hope to be able to right. include investors from all over the place, UK, US, but definitely with Nigerian participation as well. That sounds wonderful. Maybe some Australians too. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Well, well, we'll we'll end it there for today. But thank you so much for coming onto the show, and I'm and I'm, I'm thank you. like I can't wait to see you guys crack five million. Two million still blows me away, but but five million is going to make my day. Thank you. And so we're going to have thank to you. check in with you on that. And um, yeah, I'm just I'm so impressed with it, with everything you're doing. Like I, I have actually a whole whole bunch more questions, but we'll we'll follow those up on the social channels. And and uh, yeah, thank you again for joining us today on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Shape the System. As usual, if you'd like to suggest a guest, someone that you know who's helped change the system for the better, please go to www.shapethesystem.org, click on the top right-hand corner, then click Suggest Guest. Make sure that you click Subscribe 
so that you get the new episode. Shape the System is an independent podcast with support from KPMG High Growth Ventures. Connects founders to the services they need along their journey. Whether you are looking to refine your strategy, mature your finance function, prepare for a capital raise, expand abroad, or simply comply with regulatory requirements, they provide you with the support you need to drive your business forward.